Hey guys, today we are going to talk about the Battle of Tours, which happened in 732, where the Franks had a big battle against the Umeyads. Actually, it's a rather bizarre battle, and we don't really know what it represents. It's often been described as the battle where, you know, the Christian West stopped the expansion of Islam, but uh, there is no proof that this rose the case and there are very few sources on the Umayyad side. It's a battle that took on much greater importance afterwards and for a very long time afterwards, indeed for centuries today, it's a battle that is very much reused politically in France, which I think particularly annoying because it's reused for not the good reasons, I think. So let's go. <laughs> It's a 10th October morning in the year of 732, and Charles Martel, leader of the Franks, shouts a few words of encouragement to his men upon sighting the enemy. Closing in fast was an Umayyad wave of steel and swords set to crash against the dogged shield wall of their Frankish foes. The battle for the fate of Tours, and perhaps Christian Europe itself, was about to begin. For Christian Europe itself, for me, it's a huge exaggeration because the Umayyad Caliphate at this point had reached the end of its logic of conquests and the idea that there is a Christian Europe on one side against a Muslim invader on the other is not at all the right way to read the event nor the most fun. We are going to discuss it a bit later, I think. Brought to you by Curiosity Stream. By the year 732, the dynamic Islamic faith had spread far from its Arabian heartland. Already by the mid-7th century, the new Umayyad Caliphate controlled an empire stretching from Khorasan in the east to Tripoli in the west. In 711, an alliance of North African Arab and Berber adventurers invaded the Visigothic Kingdom, defeating King Roderick at the Battle of Guadalete and initiating the complete subjugation of Hispania within a few years. According to the legend, Tariq ibn Ziyad, sorry for the pronunciation guys, I think I just butchered that one, uh, burned the ships behind him in order to show its army that there was no way back. It was either conquest the Iberic Peninsula or die. With Roderick slain, Aquila had assumed the crown, only to be driven into Septimania, which was in turn conquered by 719. The Caliphate's subjugation of Septimania now extended Umayyad control into the underbelly of the Frankish world and made Odo of Aquitaine especially anxious. So, Odo is one of the main protagonists of the story. Odo is a Frankish local lord who controls a large part of the southwest of what is supposed to be the kingdom of the Franks, but it does not really longer exist. He is Charles Martel's real historical enemy and rival. In fact, the whole story is kind of a power struggle at a time when the Merovingian dynasty was coming to an end. So this dynasty was founded like 100 years ago by Clovis and by this time they are really really on the downside of their story and the realm is fractured and you have important nobles who are more or less autonomous and they are struggling because they think that there is going to be a void in this realm and there's an opportunity to become the king and to reform the Frankish kingdom. And actually reforming this old kingdom is the way to secure your prestige and your legitimacy in order to be crowned king of the Franks. Throughout 720, the Muslim governor of Al-Andalus, Al-Sam, consolidated his hold there, beginning the arduous siege of Visigothic holdout Carcassonne. 
The next year, Al Sam launched a serious attempt at conquering Toulouse, but was defeated in a daring night attack outside the city. Prince Odo's desperate charge temporarily checking the Muslim advance. During this disaster, command of the Muslim remnants was taken by a certain Abd al-Rahman al-Ghafiqi. As his name suggests, al-Rahman was of the Ghafiqi clan, one of the elite Arab clans who had settled Al-Andalus some years before. Renowned as a man of generosity, piety and courage, al-Rahman's prestige was also enhanced through his friendship with one of the sons of Umar himself who was the second of the so-called rightly guided caliphs that immediately succeeded the Prophet Muhammad. Though proving himself very capable of commanding in a crisis, Al-Rahman was replaced as governor by the senior North African governor, who saw him as too generous to the defeated men. Al-Rahman's time would come, however. Between his brief and longer services as Wali of Al-Andalus, he instead ruled Septimania from Narbonne, close to the site of the battlefield of Toulouse. So, the Wali is the governor, and before that, I read that there were six Walis between 725 and 730 in Al-Andalus, which shows that power there is very unstable. And we can also see that it's not the caliphate that's in charge here, but local lords. We are in a feudal world, not a centralized one, where the lords are on paper subjects to the caliph, of course. But in reality, they very much do what they want. They are largely autonomous in their own decisions. It's now that we turn our attention north to the Frankish world. Odo's triumph outside of Toulouse in 721 was certainly no unified Christian front against the Muslim invaders. Odo had petitioned the support of the de facto Frankish ruler Charles Martel, but had ultimately been refused and had to face the southern threat alone. Charles' refusal was symptomatic of the fragmented nature of the Frankish domain. Having united the Frankish mayoralities, the death of Charles' father Pepin of Herstal resulted in a civil war from which Charles ultimately emerged victorious. However, it was during this upheaval that in 714, Duke Odo of Aquitaine, nominally a Frankish vassal, declared himself prince of his own domain. Effectively independent from around 670 anyway, Aquitaine's borders had even expanded northwards during the Frankish decline. Yet, Here you see the other important protagonist of this story is Charles Martel. Charles was the mayor of the palace, which means the de facto ruler of the Frankish kingdom. At the time, the king was kind of a puppet. He was a member of the Merovingian dynasty, descending from Clovis, who had founded the Frankish kingdom some one century earlier, but is just like a figurehead in the kingdom. And the big struggle is between Charles and Odo. Charles wants to subjugate Odo in order to recreate the Frankish kingdom, and Odo want to do the exact opposite. He wants to secure its autonomy from Charles. It's though Odo rivaled Charles as a power of the region, his ambitions were checked in 719 and an accord was reached whereby Charles recognized Odo's status in Aquitaine in exchange for custody of his ally, King Chilperic II, whom Charles used to legitimize his own rule as sole mayor, later reinforcing his own grip on power through the do-nothing king, Thierry IV. The do-nothing king, it's an expression that was invented after them as a kind of propaganda by the Carolingians during, I think that it was under Charlemagne's reign that this was invented. It was to discredit the previous dynasty in order to reinforce your own legitimacy, a thing that a lot of regimes actually do. 
Meanwhile, in Al-Andalus, tensions between Berber and Arab Muslims would spill over into bloodshed and provided the basis for the Al-Rahman's incursion into Aquitaine the following year. Far from a harmonious polity, the Muslims of Al-Andalus were arguably as fractured as their northern foes. Tensions between the minority Arab elite and Berbers, both of whom constituted the Muslim ruling class, had simmered beneath the surface and, after hearing of the oppression of his fellow Berbers in North Africa, the regional governor Manusa threw off Umayyad control. Manusa thought it prudent to form a pact of friendship with the equally embattled Odo on his border. This alliance was sealed through the marriage of the Berber to Odo's illegitimate but beautiful daughter. For al-Rahman, Manusa's pact with an enemy bordering his lands could not go unanswered. He also likely felt he had unfinished business with Manusa's new ally too, and it seems that al-Rahman began planning his push into Aquitaine from the time of his second accession as governor. From 730 to 732, al-Rahman toured his province, engaging in the usual duties of his office, while he had also commanded his army to coalesce at Pamplona. Al-Rahman's force may have numbered from 15 to 20,000 men, though this is one of the more hotly debated areas of this campaign. Yeah, because we don't know, we have no sources once again on the Umayyad, but it's likely that it's no more than this because at this time, it's already a huge army for the era and at this time you couldn't supply more numbers with the logistics of the time. Back north, far from concerned at the build-up of Umayyad power across the Pyrenees, Charles Martel was more worried about a meeting between the ex-mayor of Neustria and Odo, which he feared may lead up to an alliance against him. Meanwhile, in the same year, Muslim raiders penetrated as far as Burgundy, nominally under Shah. There is even a rumor that Odo himself invited the Abd al-Rahman to come and destabilize the power of Charles, who was his rival, but this is highly unlikely. Charles control and even seized and burnt down the rich city of Utah. Shala evidently took the threat. So the Umayyad went up the Rhone, which is a major trading route. And for the moment, we are just talking about a raid, a bit like the Vikings in the end. But we can also say that some Umayyad conquests campaigns were preceded by such raids uh, to test and weaken the enemy defenses. At Avodo far more seriously that year, as he twice attacked northeastern Aquitaine in warning. Traversing the Loire, the Carolingian army captured and looted Bourges, though Odo swiftly retook it. In the south, probably during summer or early autumn of 731, Al-Rahman moved to crush Manusa. Moving into the rebel governor's province, he defeated his army, took his main stronghold, and then cornered Manusa himself in the mountains, Odo's ally throwing himself from a cliff to avoid capture. In either May or early June of 732, the Muslim army finally moved into Aquitaine, moving not through the usual eastern route, but via the west. This brought al-Rahman's army squarely into the heartland of Odo's power, and also avoided the Toulouse region where his predecessor had met such a sticky end. Al-Rahman's main body headed determinedly north towards Bordeaux, while smaller parties fanned off to devastate the lands between the Pyrenees and Garonne, meeting scant resistance. In answer, Odo assembled his force of Gascons and Basque militia, fixing themselves along the river Garonne. Perhaps recalling his great victory eleven years before, Odo remained outside of his capital, preferring instead to meet his foes in the field. However, unlike at Toulouse, he was defeated. Seizing Bordeaux itself, the Muslim host showed little mercy, burning any church they found and slaying many inhabitants. 
Such a prize also substantially increased their collective hoard of loot. Al-Rahman now moved to finish Odo himself, meeting the Aquitani force once more and wiping out most of his army. With little option, Odo fled north with his remaining followers to seek the aid of another enemy. Encountering Shala at Rams, the Frankish ruler responded by mustering his own army from all three of his realms. Marching to Orléans, in order to form its army and the following campaign, Charles kind of seized some of the clergy properties and wealth and kind of used force to do that. So he kind of stole money to the church, which is a kind of a blow to his image as protector of the Christendom. Charles crossed the River Loire via Ambrose and to his relief found the city of Tours within his own territory, untouched. With the defeat of Odo, Al-Rahman's army split off and raided the wider region for around three months before reassembling at the gutted Saints and heading ominously for the rich city of Poitiers. Poitiers itself was surrounded by walls, however the place had large unfortified suburbs that left it vulnerable, the Umayyads sacking and looting the Abbey Church of Saint-Hilaire. Already heavily laden with loot, Al-Rahman's army bypassed the fortified city itself and made north for the more vulnerable and even richer Abbey Church of Saint-Martin, outside the city of Tours. Yet, if the Muslim warriors looked greedily forward to this... And in France, we talk about the Battle of Poitiers, not the Battle of Tours. And I'm not sure why abroad it's known as the Battle of Tours. Perhaps it's in order to avoid any confusion with the Battle of Poitiers during the Hundred Year War. In my research, I saw that historians were not sure where this battle took place somewhere between Tours and Poitiers, and in any case, there is no archaeological site for this battle. So. ...substantial increase in their riches, then they were to be sorely disappointed. Having been halted close to crossing the Vienne by the advancing Franks, the Muslim army pulled back to a defensive position, establishing their camp between the rivers on or around the 18th of October. It's generally agreed that a period of standoff ensued. Indeed, it's likely that Charles' army was encamped on the opposite bank of the Vienne for some days and eventually crossed to make their own camp north of our modern-day hamlet. Sporadic skirmishing took place in the build-up to the main day of battle. The Frankish force fielded that day consisted of many grizzled veterans of Charles' earlier campaigns as well as less experienced militia units. Almost exclusively an infantry force, the army did, however, have a small cavalry arm, led by Odo himself. In contrast, the Umayyad army was largely mounted, more mobile and better equipped. As per the usual Umayyad practice, their camp would have been in a relatively secure location most likely on some high ground a little off and surrounded by woods. Though, as events will show, it was not as secure as to be invulnerable to attack. The Umayyad army was also likely formed in the traditional five divisions of a center, two wings, as well as a vanguard and rear guard. Given it is highly unlikely the Umayyad camp was left undefended, the Muslim rear guard was likely either close to or at the camp itself. Early Something interesting I heard is a historian said that on the morning of the battle in his mind, Charles Martel was not facing Muslims. He probably didn't even know what they were. He only sees them as pagans. On the morning of October 25th, the Umayyad army once again arrayed for battle and this time attacked the solid Frankish ranks. Charles must have been aware that his greatest chance of survival was to withstand these attacks. 
And so the Franks placed their heavy infantry arm with pikes in the front ranks on which the cavalry would break. In the few Muslim sources that we have, they mention that they have to face a wall of ice. And at the time, there was still no Frankish heavy cavalry because stirrups, which was a major military innovation, was not yet widely used and this will later enable effective frontal charges and it's something that here the Umayyads are going to lack. The repeated Muslim charges smashed bloodily against the Franks with Al-Rahman ordering probing assaults at particular points of perceived weakness. Yet despite these repeated charges and perhaps some initial fragmentation of parts of the Frankish line, Charles Franks held firm. However, the same could not be said for the Umayyad invaders. Sometime during the early afternoon, Odo, likely leading a small contingent of cavalry, rode around the main melee in a wide flanking attack on the Muslim camp. Odo's attack managed to penetrate the Muslim camp slaughtering many non-combatants, and yet he was not able to completely overrun it. As aforementioned, it's almost certain that the camp offered serious resistance, the Umayyad rear guard probably preventing a total slaughter, though the overall damage had already been done in another way. Back at the main clash, word spread through the Umayyad ranks that the camp itself was being attacked, and perhaps having little choice, Al-Rahman ordered a general withdrawal to check Odo's assault there. So they realized that they are not able to break through the Frankish ranks and without the baggage train and their wealth, they won't have enough to eat, for example, and they are going to lose all the benefits from their campaign. And we can assume that this campaign was a raising party, so the end goal is to make profit. Seizing the moment, Shala launched his own full-scale counter-attack, reaching the Muslim camp and engaging Al-Rahman and his men once more. At this stage, the second breakthrough of the battle came with the fall of the Umayyad commander himself. This, however, did not precipitate a disorderly collapse or rout, as even so, the Muslim warriors did manage to push back the Franks. Indeed, it was Shala who ordered a general withdrawal back to his own camp as the evening darkened, though he left the Muslim host battered and now leaderless. As morning dawned, the Frankish leader once more determinedly arrayed his warriors for battle, but this time no fighting ensued. The Umayyad army had taken the opportunity to withdraw in good order during the night, having... And we don't know what's going on in their army from this point. We don't know where they are going. We don't know what they are doing. What kind of repercussions this battle is having internally. We don't know the uh, consequences in Al-Andalus. Honestly, the lack of sources is a big black box on their side. We just know that it is mentioned that Al-Rahman died as kind of a martyr in this battle, but nothing much. And in fact, it could indicate that the whole affair, the whole campaign doesn't seem at all important on their side, or it's secondary. ...left their camp intact, as well as their prisoners and a hefty stash of loot. The loot alone was sufficient to stymie any serious pursuit of the invaders, as well as a general lack of cavalry. Charla himself withdrew north via Orléans, content to allow Odo to clean up the smaller Muslim groups that remained. The Battle of Tours thus concluded not so much on the tail end of an annihilation, but in a checking of the main Muslim advance. Charla well, I don't know. First of all, I don't know what they were doing here apart from raiding. It's true that after that, there will be kind of a status quo, but there will be additional raiding parties in the south of uh, the Frankish kingdom. But maybe this battle has discouraged them, so them, the Umayyads, from 
planning a wider conquest maybe it's possible but once again we don't know what they were doing we don't know their end game here had prevented Al Rahman's host from reaching the Abbey of Saint Martins and scored an unambiguous and famous victory over the Umayyad Caliphate. However, the Muslim presence in Francia was hardly eradicated. The Umayyads would remain a continuing presence in the region well past the lifetime of Shala, with Shala's son Pepin finally driving them out of Narbonne some years later. And here we see the big loser of this battle is actually, of course, al Rahman because he kind of took an arrow in the eye, but it's Odo who became a vassal to Charles and the main winner is Charles who has now um, almost total grip on the power within the Frankish kingdom. However, though contained to Al-Andalus, the long Reconquista south of Charles' domain would endure for centuries to come. If you stayed around this far, thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And so the great consequence of Poitiers is that it's going not to establish because it's pretty much on the way, but strengthen the domination of the Carolingian dynasty with Pippin after that and then Charlemagne who is going to be crowned Roman Emperor in 800 and after that it's going to also very much influence the destiny of Western Europe. Anyway, it remains a major event in the Frankish Kingdom and after that for France. Uh, don't hesitate to let me know what you felt about the whole thing in the comments. And as always, talk to you soon. Bye.